Hey there everyone. In this video I want to discuss the concept of vanishing without a trace, which is often treated as a sort of phenomenon unto itself. I get a lot of emails from folks asking me to explain how this person or that person could have vanished without a trace, or under unusual circumstances. Sometimes they might believe that there is a paranormal element to the case because it has no obvious explanation. And in most cases, I can't explain it either. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these cases where people vanish are paranormal in any way. There have been plenty of cases where people vanish without a trace, and then they are later found. And that might also come along with some explanation as to what happened to them. So in some cases, vanished without a trace just means we haven't found them. Yet. Don't get me wrong, I understand why there are many cases out there that can seem strange or possibly even paranormal. I find the best way to try and understand these types of cases is to look at some cases where people almost vanish without a trace. Now, what do I mean by this? I'm talking about missing persons cases where the individual disappears, you look at the facts, and it seems like a strange and unexplainable disappearance. But then at some point, they are found. And the explanation for their disappearance shows that we perhaps just weren't thinking outside the box. I pulled together three cases that I think exemplify what I'm talking about. After learning about them, I think you'll probably see what I mean. I strongly recommend you stick around for all three, as I think the final case is particularly interesting. Sixty-two-year-old Greg Monroe drove from his home in Victorville, California and into the New York mountains within the Mojave National Preserve on October 18, 2013. His plan was to begin deer hunting early the next day and be home by Halloween on October 31st. When Greg didn't make it back by this time, he was reported missing to the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office. On November 3rd, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office advised National Park staff of the search and rescue near the New York mountains and to be on the lookout for Greg's red 1995 Toyota pickup truck with a camper shell, which was last seen near Pinto Mountain. Greg's truck was found the next day on November 4th, exactly where they expected it would be, near Pinto Mountain. His truck and campsite was found as if it had just been set up with most of his food still there, suggesting that whatever happened to Greg, it happened early in the trip. His truck was locked and the campsite seemed undisturbed. The search for Greg consisted of up to 70 people, including helicopter crews. Both the sheriff and the NPS participated in the search and scoured the region. The sheriff's spokeswoman described the location like this. The area's mainly flat, rocky desert with some large mountain peaks and steep grades. The search for Greg Monroe could very easily have ended without success, and today we would say that he vanished without a trace, that his disappearance is mysterious and unexplained. And without knowing what actually happened to Greg, I suppose all of those things would be true. I would encourage you to think about this scenario. Greg Monroe, he arrives in the desert, sets up camp, and almost immediately disappears. The area is open, mostly flat, with some rocks and brush. What do you think could have happened to make him disappear in an area like this? I suppose you could say that he walked outside the search area and got lost, and died somewhere far away. But I'm sure if Greg was never found, some people would look at this situation and see it as something paranormal. A man who disappeared in the desert where there was nowhere for him to go. Fortunately, we do know what happened to Greg Monroe, and most people would probably never guess what the answer is. On November 7th, a searcher from Orange County was scouring the brushland about half a mile from Greg's campsite when they had a very close call. In front of the searcher, and completely covered by the heavy brush, was a 30 inch by 30 inch hole in the ground. The hole turned out to be a very old well shaft that was forgotten and overgrown by the surrounding brushland. It was later determined that the well was 40 feet deep and half full of water, but at the bottom was the body of Greg Monroe. It appears that Greg was scouting the terrain around his campsite shortly after his arrival in the area. 
As he wandered around, he fell right into the well shaft that was near impossible to see. Once Greg was in the well, there was no way he could have gotten out. Reports do not mention the official cause of death for Greg, only that his body was found in the well. Truly a sad and tragic accident to happen to anyone, but Greg's story illustrates a point that sometimes the explanation for an unusual disappearance is something that you may not have considered before. Most people who walk around in places like the Mojave National Preserve probably don't think that the next step they take might send them tumbling down a 40-foot well shaft. And looking at the pictures of this shaft, you can see that if searchers had not discovered and cleared the brush from this well, Greg Monroe may never have been found. His name could have been added to the list of disappearances that have no obvious explanation, and would probably be added to the list of missing 411 cases. Cases such as this are useful to get people thinking outside the box when it comes to explanations for so-called unexplainable missing persons cases. Let's check out the next case. Twenty-three-year-old Tatum Morell traveled from her home in Idaho to Montana's Beartooth Mountains. Tatum was an engineering graduate student from Montana State University and also an avid and experienced hiker who was planning to climb five mountain peaks in the West Fork of Rock Creek. Though this was Tatum's first trip to the Beartooth Mountains, it was not her first experience with this type of terrain. She backpacked into the area and camped at Shadow Lake on Thursday, July 1, 2021. That same evening around 8 p.m., she contacted her family via an in-reach satellite communicator device to let them know she was okay. This would also be the last time anyone heard from Tatum Morell. Sometime on July 2nd, Tatum left her campsite and did not return. The search for Tatum began on July 5th and involved multiple search and rescue in law enforcement agencies, dog teams, helicopters, ground searchers, and others. The terrain of the area was very rugged, rocky, and generally difficult to navigate. Tatum's orange and gray tent was found still set up in the Shadow Lake area. Knowing that Tatum was planning to hike up a number of different peaks, Searchers focused their efforts on a number of different areas and routes, including Sundance, Baoback, Castle, and Whitetail Mountains. At night, helicopters used infrared cameras to try and spot her. Despite the use of significant resources and manpower, searchers were unable to find any trace of Tatum Morell in the area. Now, quite a few people may remember this case because it was well publicized at the time. I remember this case because as it was happening, as there were searchers still on the ground, I was receiving emails from people asking me to cover this case for numerous reasons. Among them was that it was a missing 411 case currently happening right before our eyes, that her disappearance was clearly paranormal and that Bigfoot may have been somehow involved. It really has been the only time I was inundated with so many emails regarding a current case. Now, as a rule, I generally try to stay away from cases that are so fresh there are still searchers on the ground. There is simply too much uncertainty at that point. We don't have enough information. Search and rescue hasn't finished doing their job. The sheriff may or may not be investigating. In Tata Morell's case, the search turned up nothing. But almost two months later, in late August, a group of hikers were in the area of Whitetail Peak when they came across some hiking gear. Shortly thereafter, they discovered a boot sticking out from the rocky mountainside. Now, they were aware that there had recently been a search and rescue in the area, so they used a satellite device to contact authorities immediately. They had discovered the body of Tata Morell. She was located in an area that had been searched many times before, but the problem was that she was almost entirely buried by rocks. It appears that Tatum had been attempting to climb Whitetail Peak sometime on July 2nd, when a rock slide occurred, burying her and also taking her life. Because she was covered up in the rock slide, searchers were unable to see her as they scoured the area. Tatum's remains were then airlifted out of the area and her case was subsequently closed. Like all cases of this nature, it is an absolute tragedy, but also something to learn from. This was a situation where search and rescue probably walked very close to Tatum's actual location, 
This was also a situation where search dogs were unable to track her scent. Searchers of both the human and canine variety are fallible, and there is likely nothing more they could have done in this situation. But if Tatum Morell had never been found, I am certain some people would be saying that the failure of these searchers to turn up any shred of evidence, or the failure of these canines to track any scent, must be because something paranormal occurred when in fact it was all due to a tragic rock slide. Now, shifting gears real quick, I want to briefly mention a completely different case. A few months ago, I had a couple of emails regarding the disappearance of actor Julian Sands in Mount Baldy, California. This disappearance was well publicized, likely due to Mr. Sands' status as an actor, but still, to this day, Julian Sands has not been found. It should be noted that evidence of avalanches were seen in the area of Mount Baldy and the entire search area was temporarily closed due to the threat of avalanches. Why do I bring this case up? Because avalanches and rock slides are real threats that hikers and climbers face. When someone disappears without a trace on a mountainside, like Mr. Sands did, the most likely explanation is probably that he was buried by an avalanche. Can we be certain of this? No, we won't know for certain unless he is found one day. But cases like that of Tata Morell show us how these events can completely stifle search efforts. Is that also what occurred in the case of Julian Sands? It's certainly a possibility, and at this time it seems like the most likely one as well. Now let's take a look at one more case. Thirty-nine-year-old Raymond Jones lived in Salmon, Idaho, where he owned a service station and dairy products distributorship. Raymond was known as an avid hunter and outdoorsman, someone who could take care of himself if he was ever lost. On September 7, 1968, Raymond, along with two other hunter friends, Ralph Pearson and Dale Baird, was out bow hunting in the Hayden Creek area, some 30 miles southeast of Salmon. The group were in the area looking for deer, elk, and bighorn sheep. At about 1.30 p.m. on Saturday, the group split up and Raymond was last seen hiking up the ridge that separates the East Fork of Hayden Creek with the Tobias drainage. Raymond was last seen wearing camouflage clothing, brown boots, and a brown hat. He also carried a camouflage bow and his face was painted to act as camouflage. Raymond's hunting companions would report him missing early on September 8th. The Lemhi County Sheriff, Bill Baker, would arrive in the area by the late afternoon. The official search began shortly thereafter and involved nearly 100 volunteers and searchers, dog teams and airplanes. During the search, nothing of value was found. One day, searchers discovered a trail of blood drops and also heard a gunshot, but their origin was never determined. The search was also plagued by bad weather and conditions, with at least one heavy rainstorm hitting the area. The Lemhi County Sheriff's Office terminated their involvement in the search by September 12th, after the search had turned up absolutely no clues. Sheriff Baker would tell newspapers that he believed Raymond was dead, and was quoted saying, I don't think there's a piece of ground up there that hasn't been flown over ten times or walked over once or twice. The sheriff believed that Raymond may have fallen on one of his own arrows or been buried by a rock slide while noting they had noticed several fresh slides in the area. Still, about 70 volunteers remained in the mountains afterwards and one helicopter continued the aerial search. Raymond had two brothers who joined the search and were also adamant about continuing the search on their own. It wouldn't take long before the search for Raymond was restarted after the discovery of footprints on a ridge between Hayden Creek and the Possimoroi Valley on September 13th. A district forest ranger would tell newspapers that the tracks were found in an area that was not previously searched. The ranger also indicated that tracking dogs were to be flown in as the search resumed. The renewed search efforts proved futile as nothing was found that led to Raymond's location. By September 17th, about a week and a half into the search, only two deputies and two dogs remained in the search area. In October, Raymond's family would place a notice in the newspapers thanking everyone who volunteered or assisted in the search. Afterwards, search attempts seemed to have petered out 
and the disappearance of Raymond Jones seemed like it would remain unsolved forever. Years after Raymond's disappearance, his widow, Donna Jones, would have Raymond declared deceased via the Lemhi County Courts. Fifty-three years would pass, when on September 17, 2021, the Lemhi County Sheriff was informed of a report of found human remains in the East Fork of Hayden Creek. A deputy subsequently made contact with the reporting party, Christopher Williams, via a cell phone call. At the time, Mr. Williams was still in the area where he had found the remains. Mr. Williams stated that he was bow hunting in the area of Hayden Creek when he decided to take a shortcut from one hunting area to another and happened upon a boot that appeared to have a foot bone still contained within it. Mr. Williams then began to look around the area some more and came across a skull and a femur bone as well. He then found a broken fiberglass arrow nearby. Mr. Williams marked the GPS location of the remains and sent pictures of the scene to the deputy. The deputy told him not to touch anything and leave the area. On September 18th, members of the Sheriff's Office and Forest Service traveled to the East Fork of Hayden Creek to investigate and document the remains found the day prior. The remains were located near the base of a sheer cliff around 9,000 feet in elevation. The group examined the area and found human skeletal remains scattered in about a 15-yard circle. In the center of the circle, there was a large flat rock approximately 5 feet long and 4 feet wide. Below the rock, at the base of a small tree, were pieces of a human skull. The skull itself was very weathered and not intact. Deputies excavated the area a bit and discovered one small tooth as well. To the east of the skull were two shriveled leather boots with vibram soles. One of the boots still contained bones. Between the rock that formed the center of the circle and the skull, deputies located the remains of a wallet. The wallet itself was in very poor condition, but contained a plastic card with the name Raymond Jones inscribed on it. A rusted fixed blade knife, a broken fiberglass arrow, several small scraps of leather material, and several small unidentified bones were found nearby. The deputies then checked underneath the rock that formed the center of the circle, where they found what appeared to be a femur bone. This femur was removed without difficulty, but there was another femur bone underneath the rock that could not be dislodged. The deputies then combined their efforts to move the rock from its resting place. Once removed, the deputy notes in his report that there was a faint scent of decomposition. Under the rock, they found a partial pelvis bone, the other femur, several small bones, a metal elk whistle, a wad of rope, a button, and several pieces of leather-like fabric. Afterwards, the deputies collected all the remains and personal effects they had found and removed them from the area. Later on, a Lemhi County Sheriff's deputy attempted to locate Raymond Jones next of kin. This led him to Raymond's granddaughter, Dana Jones. Dana informed the deputy that she was currently caring for her grandmother, Donna Jones, Raymond's widow. Donna was now in her 90s and in assisted living while also suffering from dementia. Dana confirmed for the deputy that her grandfather was Raymond Jones and that he had been missing in the Idaho mountains since 1968. But the deputy was also able to speak with Raymond's widow, Donna. He notes in his report that she seemed to have issues distinguishing the past with the present, likely due to her dementia. The deputy explained to her that her husband, Raymond, had finally been found. Strangely, Donna told the deputy that she knew that he was going to be calling her that day. Donna stated that Raymond had come to her in a dream the night before and informed her that he had been found in a rocky crevice in the East Fork of Hayden Creek. Donna was hoping that the deputy would be bringing him back to her alive but the deputy notes that she did understand that he was currently deceased. Donna told the deputy that Raymond had been absolutely fearless and that due to this fearlessness, he would sometimes take unnecessary chances. After reading countless police reports, I can say that this is one of the most unusual and at the same time incredible interviews I have ever seen in a missing persons investigation. Following the interview, the remains of Raymond Jones were transferred to his family. 
The story of Raymond Jones is really quite fascinating. And while I'm aware this case is considered a missing 411 case, when I look at the facts and evidence, I don't necessarily see anything unexplainable or mysterious going on here, with the possible exception of Donna Jones' premonition that her husband would be found. Raymond Jones was someone who, for 53 years, was considered an individual who vanished without a trace. He disappeared one day, a thorough search turned up absolutely nothing. He just vanished. And then one day he is found. If you've been paying close attention, then you might have developed some theories of your own as to what may have happened to Raymond. The hunter who discovered Raymond's remains noticed layers of slab rock in the cliff above and believed that Raymond may have been trying to scale the cliff when a piece of rock broke off and crushed him. The rock on top of Raymond appeared to match the rock that made up the cliff face. The sheriff didn't seem to advance many theories other than to say he most likely fell. I think they're all probably on the right track. The evidence would seem to be pretty clear that Raymond was crushed by a rather large piece of rock. What is up for debate is how that rock fell on Raymond. When it fell, it likely killed him rather quickly. When the search occurred, I doubt he was still alive or able to call out to anyone. In fact, most of his body was probably hidden under the rock. Because of this, I think it's maybe not so surprising after all that the searchers were unable to find him. You would probably have to walk very close to his location to even see him. Either way, I look at Raymond's case as yet another example of the many dangers of the outdoors. When theorizing about what could have happened to Raymond, I doubt many people even considered that he was crushed by a large rock. Again, sometimes the explanation for a case can be relatively simple, but until it's right in front of your face, you can't really see it. For all three of the individuals we discussed here, had they not been found, we would have said that they vanished without a trace. The searchers and the canines turned up nothing. No clothing or equipment was found indicating their path of travel. These cases could very easily have turned into enduring mysteries that many people would label as paranormal. Fortunately, they were found, and in each case we get to learn about what actually caused them to go missing in the first place. These are the types of cases I try to keep in mind whenever looking at a case that still remains unsolved, or that outwardly appears to be very strange. I have to remind myself that the answer could be very likely something that I haven't considered yet. Ultimately, you'll never know what the answer is unless the missing individual is found, and even then it's not assured. Hopefully you found something of value in examining these cases. If this kind of video is popular, perhaps we can go over other similar cases of people who almost vanished without a trace. And until next time, thanks for watching.